Human beings are capable of horrifying, spine-chilling deeds. We've all heard of the worst evils inflicted upon innocence, and every year a new case stuns us into silence, making us wonder if there's a line humans won't cross. In this series, we're going to look at disturbing real-life crimes. This is Cold-Blooded Crimes. Burton Abbott was born in Oregon on February 8, 1928. Growing up, he wasn't as physically capable as other boys. He spent most of his life with a slight build, contracting tuberculosis, and the fact that he only had half a lung didn't make things easier. In any case, by the time he was 27 years old, Burton had enrolled in the University of California at Berkeley, where he studied accounting. He had a modest home on San Jose Avenue, where he lived with his wife, Georgia Abbott, their two-year-old son, Christopher, and his mother, Elsie Abbott. His life seemed standard. He was a promising student with a family and a home. But on July 15, 1955, everything turned upside down. Georgia, his wife, dialed the police to inform them that she had discovered personal items belonging to Stephanie Bryan in their basement. Stephanie had been missing for over two weeks. She disappeared on April 28, 1955, while walking home from school. She usually took a shortcut, which led through the parking lot of the Claremont Hotel. Nobody had any clue what had happened to her. After her family reported Stephanie missing, the authorities went to painstaking lengths to find her. Despite chasing several leads and the mysterious clues the police encountered along the way, they couldn't crack Stephanie's disappearance. They went so far as to use bloodhounds to no avail. Georgia's call was the first solid lead the authorities received. As it turned out, Georgia found Stephanie's identification card and her purse while she was in the basement. After the call, the police went to the Abbott's home and searched the place. They found Stephanie's school books, a pair of glasses, and a brassiere. After interviewing Burton's family, the police also found out that Elsie, Burton's mother, had found Stephanie's purse earlier on. She simply hadn't made the connection to the missing girl that was starting to dominate the news. When the police questioned Burton, he had an alibi. He claimed he was on a fishing trip. On the day Stephanie disappeared, he was driving to a family cabin about 285 miles away in Trinity County. A San Francisco Examiner reporter, Ed Montgomery, followed up on Burton's alibi and visited the family cabin in Trinity County along with the police. To his horror, he found Stephanie's body in a shallow grave just a few hundred feet from Abbott's family cabin. When the authorities later dug up Stephanie's body, it was clear she had been bludgeoned to death. The authorities, believing Burton to be the man behind this heinous crime, charged him with the rape and murder of Stephanie Bryan. In the following months, the media picked up the case and ran numerous headlines, branding Burton as a monster, a murderer. By the time Burton saw his day in court on November 7th, 1955, many people had already made up their minds. He was guilty of kidnapping, rape, and murder. From the start, proving his innocence was an uphill battle, one he was unlikely to win. That didn't stop Burton from trying to assert his innocence, though. Just a few days after the police initially unearthed Stephanie's body, Burton voluntarily took a lie detector test. He wanted to prove that he knew nothing about Stephanie's disappearance. On top of that, none of the evidence that the prosecution presented directly tied Burton to Stephanie's murder. All evidence was purely circumstantial. Although the prosecutors made Burton out to be a murderous, sexual deviant, they had very little evidence to back their claims. The defense, on the other hand, had a much stronger case. They brought forward four reputable witnesses who saw Burton hundreds of miles away from LA the same day Stephanie was kidnapped. To counter Burton's witnesses, the prosecution resorted to inflaming the jury and provoking an emotional response from all who were present. They even tried to submit a photo of Stephanie's corpse, which the judge disallowed. The judge did allow the prosecution to brandish the clothes Stephanie was found with. The odor from these clothes was so strong that spectators in the courtroom went out for fresh air. Burton was not impressed with all the antics. 
He said it was all a monstrous frame-up. When questioned about items that were in his basement, which belonged to Stephanie, Burton maintained that he did not know how they got there, although he suggested someone might have left them there earlier that year when his basement served as a polling station. Unfortunately for Burton, the prosecution was persistent. They wouldn't let anyone forget Stephanie's horrifying death. Emotions trumped facts. In the end, Assistant District Attorney Folger Emerson proclaimed, I think it is time to say from the evidence of this case that the original intent of the defendant when he kidnapped Stephanie Bryan was to commit a sex crime. I think that what happened to Stephanie before she was killed was worse than death itself. If ever there was a crime that fit the punishment of death, this is it. The prosecution concluded by branding Burton a typical psychopath and a pathological liar. They said that he dropped clues like a trail of corn and that's what led to his arrest. The jury deliberated for seven days, which was surprising to most because the prosecution painted the proceeding as an open and shut case. The truth is, there was a lot of doubt about whether Burton was a cold-blooded killer after all. Whatever the case, the jury returned with a guilty verdict. Burton was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. Burton spent a year in prison awaiting his execution. While his lawyers did everything they could to commute the sentence, Burton's execution was scheduled for March 15, 1957, at 11 p.m. His lawyers had petitioned the Court of Appeal to overturn the sentence, to no avail. They then reached out to the Governor of California, appealing to him through a television broadcast. The Governor agreed to two stays of execution that day, as Burton's legal team appealed to various courts without success. At 11.15 a.m., Burton found himself strapped to a chair in a gas chamber. The room was dead silent. The executioner would later drop pallets of sodium cyanide into a tub of sulfuric acid. The resulting reaction would produce cyanide gas. Burton's team had secured another stay from the governor while Burton awaited his death, but the governor didn't reach the warden of the prison on time. When the pallets of sodium cyanide reacted with the sulfuric acid in the gas chamber, Burton held his breath for as long as he could. His next breath was his last. Two figures stood by his side from the beginning, believing him to be the victim of a frame-up, as Burton himself had put it. His mother, Elsie, and Keith Walker, a newspaper man. Elsie Abbott claimed the real killer was none other than her brother, Wilbur Moore, who was a truck driver residing in San Leandro. Keith Walker wrote a book about the entire case. He titled the book, A Trail of Corn. A picture of Elsie, who was crushed and inconsolable after her son's death, is on the cover of the book. Keith interviewed Elsie whilst writing the book and left the interview believing that Burton could not have been the killer. Elsie mentioned that Burton had tuberculosis and other physical ailments, which would have made it difficult to execute a kidnapping, let alone beat someone to death and then bury them miles away. Another curious twist in this tale, featuring a waitress who Burton claimed he saw while away on his trip, also weighed heavy on Keith's mind. During Burton's testimony, he claimed he met a blonde waitress on his way to the cabin, but the owner of the restaurant denied having a dusty blonde as an employee. This revelation was damaging to Burton's case. But after his death, Elsie and Keith tracked down the dusty blonde waitress who confirmed Burton's alibi. She even gave detailed descriptions of the clothes Burton was wearing that day. Elsie died in 2004 after turning 100 years old. She died believing her son was murdered by the state of California. It's unclear if the case of Stephanie's death will ever be re-examined. But reflecting on the spectacle decades later, Keith was moved to tears at the thought of what Elsie went through and that an innocent man was framed and then executed by the state. He dedicated his book, A Trail of Corn, to Elsie. She was devastated, I tell you, devastated. You saw her picture on the front of the book. That's, that, was the, that was when the, day, when the uh, verdict was announced. The, the, the photographer caught her just as the verdict was announced. She was devastated. She said, well, if he did, had done it, okay. But she didn't feel he did. And therefore she felt he should be found innocent. And she was determined to try to help show that he was innocent. 
If you enjoyed this episode, comment below whether you think Burton was guilty of murdering Stephanie or not, and should the state of California re-examine this case in light of all the evidence suggesting Burton was in fact innocent. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more videos like this one. Until next time, 